your players put in so much work and I didn't want to see them fail. Your coaching staff, they put in so much work, you don't want to see them fail. So when you look yourself in the mirror at night, it's like, did I do everything in my power to put these players and put these coaches in the best position to develop and win football games on Saturday? And there was a lot of failure being a young defensive coordinator and you can either bury your head in the sand or you can look in the mirror and you can learn from those mistakes and then in the off season, go and attack your deficiencies and your weaknesses. And that's what I'm trying to do every single year. If you stay stagnant in this industry, you're going to get caught and you're going to get passed up. Shane Durkin is the defensive coordinator for the 2022 Division III National Champions North Central College, and he was named the Football Scoop D3 Coordinator of the Year. In this episode, we learn of the obsession with learning the game of football that developed at a young age and continues for him today. We talk about his 4-2-5 defense and the 3-3 stack package within it and his approach to the profession and his view on how to achieve success and continue growing. Coach Durkin does have a course on defending the empty formation and will be presenting at Lauren's first and goal as well. Click the link in the show notes to see that and learn more. What you see on tape is a direct reflection of what you teach and how you teach. Video is important, but if you don't teach well, you're not going to like what you see on your video. First Down Playbook has been helping coaches teach better for 13 years. It allows you to present installs, playbooks, and practice cards in half the time with NFL quality. Coaching tools like video pairing, a player app, practice schedules, and wristband sheets have made First Down Playbook a program management system with everything in one place. If you're in a position of leadership with your football program, receive a free one-week look at First Down Playbook. Call them at 512-814-6158 or visit them on their website or social media. Mention Coach and Coordinator Podcast or use the coupon code COACH24 to receive a $100 discount off the normal $700 First Down Playbook team membership price. Links and the phone number are in the show notes. As coaches, we know that some of the biggest hurdles to our team's success can come from off the field. Your team needs support to tackle the endless list of expenses, uniforms, training equipment, travel, and more. But raising that money can feel like a full-time job. Thankfully, there's Vertical Raise. Vertical Raise is the premier online fundraising platform using innovative technology to create the easiest and most efficient system available. Raise more money in less time with a local fundraising coach who works with your team every step of the way to customize the ideal fundraiser. With options for online donations, digital discount cards, premium product sales, and even spirit shops, Vertical Raise has top-of-the-line solutions for every fundraising style. To find out more, visit verticalraise.com and we'll get you connected with an exclusive offer on your first fundraiser. I'm excited to be joined on the podcast today by the Football Scoop Coordinator of the Year in 2022 for Division Three. He's the defensive coordinator at North Central National Champions, Shane Durking. Shane, it's great to have you here on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Keith. I've really been looking forward to getting you on here. I know I've seen some of your clinics over the last few years. I know you've done some of the virtual clinics and done a great job, so it's great to be actually be talking ball with you. I know you come from a football family with you know father and brother played at Purdue. Your dad played in the NFL. So football has been in your blood, but for you, what was it that helped you decide that coaching was the way you wanted to go with your professional life? Yeah. So coming from a family with a football background, you know, we had a love for the game, you know, very early on, but I kind of realized I was a little different for my brother. He just loved training and playing the game and my my dad was the same way but I was fanatical about following everything in college football and not missing a single game day and I early on I would chart every single draft pick on NFL draft day and I just became obsessed with the game and really my love grew for it once I got into a great program at North Central here I saw the coaches and how much they had an impact on myself and the other players and you can be successful you can win championships while still doing it the right way and developing men and then I just started asking questions to the coaches and found out you can make a living and I said ended up having three business degrees but being a college football coach nothing's going to beat that and that's how I fell into the industry. 
You've spent a lot of time at North Central, North Central grad. You've been there as a coach for a while now, too. And uh, so a lot of your influences come from there. Uh, your head coach is a, one of the top receivers there. So a, a lot of North Central background within your coaching staff. But for you, when you look at the influences on you, whether that's been guys you've worked directly with or guys you've studied, who, who have been influential in helping you develop as a coach and especially as a defensive coordinator? The three coaches I've been under at North Central, John Thorne, he's a major piece of, you know, why I decided to come to North Central. He preached faith, family, academics, and football, and he was just such a great man, and, and everything he says he is, and that's the same as Jeff Thorne and, and Brad Spencer, and, you know, I learned every single day, you know, from those guys and to see what they've done with North Central because before John Thorne got here in 2002, North Central hadn't had a winning season in 15 years. So everybody looks at North Central now and thinks that it was always this way, but it's really only been the last 20 years. So what those three have done with the program is just phenomenal. From a defensive standpoint, the guys I really like to study, from a coverage standpoint, really the Saban and, and Kirby Smart tree, from you know, a defensive presentation standpoint, Gary Patterson, Phil Parker at Iowa, Hankowitz, who was at Northwestern, and in his time there, one of my best friends was on staff, so I was always picking their brains. From a pressure standpoint, Venables, Narduzzi, and then within our 3-3 stack package, I like studying, you know, the Iowa State and a lot of the guys and what they're doing in the Big 12 over the past few years. For you, the opportunity to become a D.C. came very early, you were 24 years old, and you, you mentioned that you didn't necessarily feel you were fully prepared for the opportunity, but you became obsessed with it. Talk us through that beginning for you and that obsession and how that helped you really move things along quickly. Yeah, so I always had a true love for the game, and all I wanted to be early in my career was be the best at what my current job was and be the best, you know, secondary coach, coaching safeties and coaching corners and get my hands on as, as many books and clinic talks as I could, you know, and then I had a head coach that put me in the position kind of midway through the year and said, Hey, I want you to lead the defense and said quickly, Hey, I got to figure out this run game stuff. I know gaps and all that, but the run fits, you know, were a little foreign, especially within the core of the defense. But I think the, uh, obsession really came with being a competitor and your players put in so much work and I didn't want to see them fail. Your coaching staff, they put in so much work, you don't want to see them fail. So when you look yourself in the mirror at night, it's like, did I do everything in my power to put these players and put these coaches in the best position to develop and win football games on Saturday? And there was a lot of failure being a young defensive coordinator. And you can either bury your head in the sand or you can look in the mirror and you can learn from those mistakes. And then in the off season, go and attack your deficiencies and your weaknesses. And that's what I'm trying to do every single year. If you stay stagnant in this industry, you're going to get caught or you're going to, and you're going to get passed up just because there's so many great coaches out there, you know, that have such a great passion for this game. So that that's really been you know, my motivation every year is to change my best because that's what our players and staff deserve. So 2022 football scoop coordinator of the year, two national championships, does that obsession go away at all or does that continue to drive you? I think there's two different types of people when you have success. There's some that just love to get patted on the back and then become complacent and say, hey, I was number one this year and that's going to be enough if I just stay the same. And then there's the second person who, when they get that success, it just fuels them even more. And they have even more of a burning desire because they want that feeling again, and they're never satisfied. That's really what we're talking with our team about is everybody else is changing and adapting to chase us, right? And we have a target on our back every week. And if we just stay the same, we're going to get passed up. And that's really the burning desire is to be the best, you have to change your best every single day. If you stay stagnant, you're going to get passed up, and that's what we're attacking with our team and with our staff right now. I want to get into a little bit of your defense here and some of the things that you do, but before we do that, for the sake of our listeners, if you could please just describe what the philosophy is and what you base this out of. 
we're a four two five base defense and you know we are truly a four two five. A lot of guys say that. We have a nickel who's more of a safety at that same position. We want to be extremely multiple in coverage. I think that's something in today's age of football, you always need to be confusing the quarterback. Within that, we have thirty four variations of coverage, but you can only run as many coverages as you can teach and your kids are comfortable with. You know, so we have a big toolbox within coverage. In the run game we're going to be four down unless we get into third and seven plus. We get to two minute end of game scenarios where we get to our three three stack stuff. But within the run game, we want to be physical. We want to spill the football. We want to send it east and west, right? There's times you have to box the football back based off of coverage or based off of front. But we want the ball going to the perimeter and getting it to our pursuit and being great within block destruction, great within pursuit, great within tackling. My pressure percentages have gone down. The older I've gotten, I was more aggressive in our earlier years. And this year we had an unbelievable defensive line, the best defensive line in the country in Division Three. So you can get after the quarterback with four on choice down, and you can get after him with three or four on third down. That allowed us to run all those coverages. But you got to get pressure on the quarterback. you got to confuse the quarterback. Be simple in the run game so your guys can be violent. They can pursue the football east and west. Well, you mentioned the, the defensive line there and that you've, over over the time here, pressured less and less. Has that been because you've found better defensive linemen or has it been maybe more of a focus on the way you develop those guys and what you're asking them to do? This past year, we had three fifth-year seniors that our defensive line coach, Coach Janicek, has molded since they were freshmen. Two of them played for us as freshmen. In regards to pressuring less, if you can put pressure on the quarterback with four, you can do so much in coverage. And for us, the change within our defense the last two years is really going back and looking at the games that we lost or the games that we gave up over your standard 20 to 25 points. A lot of it came back to explosive plays, right? So we talk about all the time, tight top down coverage, A lot of offenses and a lot of offensive coordinators are going to get impatient once they hit double digits in the drive. You get past 10 plays, they want to find that explosive. And as long as you keep the football in front, you play sound defense, and you make the offense earn everything, you're going to see an impact on your yards per game, your points per game, and your wins and losses. And that's something that, you know, I had to learn the hard way as a young defense coordinator, wanted to be aggressive, wanted to be tight to everything within coverage. But if you get the offense to double-digit plays, most of the time you're going to be successful. And if you coach your kids well enough, you can outlast the offense. I agree with that. I know being on the offensive side, it takes discipline and patience. You need an explosive play. You need an explosive play in a drive. It greatly increases your chances. But you got to pick your spots, and if it's you know you get impatient with that, and that defense is just sitting back, uh, it could be a very frustrating afternoon. Absolutely, and that's you know been a change in mentality, and our DBs get tired of hearing it, but they see it within the results. And when you preach something, and the and the kids see the results, so that that's a big factor. You know, they always want to ask why, and then uh, you can show them you can show them the proof. Now you said you're a four two five defense, a true four two five, but you do bring in the 3-3 stack situationally. Talk to us about how that fits into your package. Yeah, so really started to study the 3-3 stack when I was at my previous school, Benedictine. We just didn't have the defensive tackles to run the 4-2-5 system that we wanted to, and I didn't want to be stubborn, and we got through week four, and it just wasn't working, and we had a bye week. And that's always stuff I like to study for third downs, but we had to take the 3-3 stack and make it our base defense. So I just studied as much as I could, and through trial and error, that ended up becoming our base defense the rest of the year because we played in a spread league, you know, a lot of 10 personnel, a little bit of 11. And then really coming to North Central where we did have those guys on the interior where we could play the 4-2-5, it really just became our third down package and our two-minute and then the game. But I love it because it's such a different presentation than our 4 2 five. It's really difficult on offenses. We really move that nickel to that Sam linebacker, and then we put another DB on the field where we can run our drop eight coverages, only rushing three, but then we can add that fourth and we can run all of our four, two, five coverages behind it, but it's just different guys in different positions. 
as well as our overload pressures based off of protection. And we can play more man coverage within that because we have another DB on the field. So I think having that presentation, it's a lot of fun for our guys. It's getting them different guys on the field in different positions. And I think it's difficult for offenses to defend just because the presentation is much different than our choice down four two five. Yeah, you mentioned that you you'll go to a drop eight, you know, with three rushing and still then bring somebody to get into four. Um, really, you know, for me and I think a lot of people just consider a pressure anything five or more. So you mentioned though doing yeah. some overload pressures. Is this in these situations, is that something you, you tend to do that a little bit more is this more of a pressure package for you yeah so our pressure percentage will be higher it'll be usually 30 to 35 percent as our 45 was only 17 percent same as you you know i only consider pressures you know five or more but these are also in those passing situations when you're getting higher percentages from the offense on offensive protection tendencies so that's another advantage of when you get into it, we're in heavier passing situations. Are you treating this like a nickel package? You know, you bringing in an extra DB, taking a guy out. How do you approach that? Yeah, so we're, we're putting in really a dime. So we've got three true defensive linemen, really two true linebackers, and then six DBs if, because we still count that nickel as that, as that secondary player. So it's really a guy who – this last year, it was more of our third safety, but there's been years it's our third corner. It's got to be a guy that has a great understanding of all the positions on the back end because when we bring that forth, positions are changing all the time. So this year, it was our third safety, but some years it's, it's that third corner. It's whoever's the next best available who's an intelligent football player that knows our defense inside and out on the back end, but can also play great man coverage, like I talked about, because our pressure percentages are going to be higher than our choice down. Now, in addition to third down, you like this in two-minute as well. What for you is advantageous using this kind of package in a two-minute situation? With our drop eight coverages, we can funnel and we want to keep the football top down. We want to keep it in front of us. We want to keep it in bounds. And in some of our our top top it our uh, drop eight coverages right do just that so it it fits but then again getting more speed on the field and then we can still add our fourth with a better coverage guy on the back end give the offense that that different presentation and still run our pressures and just play it a little bit more conservative within that two minute but our top coverages within it We've got a lot where we can funnel the football, keep it in bounds, keep that clock rolling, and keep it in front of us. You guys had a string of eight straight weeks without giving up a touchdown. You also had one of the best, if not the best, offense in the country in Division Three. So guys scoring a lot of points, meaning that the second half is going to be up to backup. So I think that shows how well you're preparing not just your starters but your backups playing majority of the second half. So talk to us about – how you do that, how you're able to prepare those guys, get the reps they need, be able to trust them with everything you trust that first team with. We talk about there's no drop off in the standard just because somebody else is out there. You know, whether that be injury or whether that be in the second half of a football game where you get, you know, those second, third string guys in there and everybody's got to prepare like they're the starter. And if you're not about that from a preparation standpoint within film study, within how you, your practice habits, within what you're doing in the weight room, you don't last long and you're not going to get the opportunity because our players, our starters are the ones that are coaching those guys and holding them accountable. It's not okay to be the third string week safety and not know what we're doing this week because you could very well get the opportunity to be in that football game and there can't be any drop off within that stretch. We never talked about in a game plan meeting on Tuesday, like, hey, let's keep this streak going, or hey, this week I expect a shutout. Every play is a life of its own, and you have to be your very best on that play because that's what your teammates and your fifth-year seniors deserve. And when you just focus on your job, your teammates, and your why as an individual – and you attack every play like it's a life of its own, you're going to see the results. And that's really the mentality. It's not about stats. It's not about getting shutouts. It just happened to play out that way. And, and that's what we would pride our 
in our Sunday meetings, we, I would talk about the second team guys a lot. Hey, the second team guys came in, they didn't let up, they had three series, they didn't let up a first down. So the more that you pour into those guys who aren't getting their name in the paper, but they're out there doing their job to the highest standard, I think they feel valued and they're going to fight really, really hard for you and really buy into what you're talking about. In having success and really being named to a, you know, defensive coordinator at 24, you're still very young in this game, two national championships were named, you know, division three football scoop coordinator of the year. So a lot of success. Sometimes it's easy to get lost in that. What's your approach really to, to be able to stay focused? Cause I think you would agree like the things that are going to happen for you as you advance through this profession aren't because you, you start focusing on, wow, I, you know, I'm, I'm really good right now. I should be at a bigger place. It never really happens that way. What, what's your approach to this moving forward and continuing to grow professionally and working to continue to have success? When I was in my early 20s, maybe even mid-20s, you know, you start looking around and comparing yourself to other people and saying, and making your own goals saying, hey, I want to be at this level in this position at this age. And that is the wrong way to go about it. And one of my best friends within the coaching industry you know, Kevin Cook, when I was at, at Benedictine, he now is a coach for the Chicago Bears. And he just talked about be where your feet are. And that's something that's always stuck with me because the more you focus on what you are doing in your position and loving and coaching your players and coaching up your coaching staff, the better everything is going to work out. And you're going to see that success. If you're worried about, hey, this guy's my age, he's in this position at this school, that is the thief of joy. Then you start thinking about other people and looking at, hey, I, I deserve this. And once I changed that mentality, you know, about four or five years ago and just focus on being my best in this position, I love my job. I love the head coach I work for. I love the people I work with. I love our players. I love North Central. And going all in for that, you see the results now. You know, and that's that's really been – I'm going to run my race and focus on what I'm doing. And that's what I try and tell our young coaches now that, you know, I'm transitioning to not being a young coach because I, I, I think that's the way to go about it in this industry. Don't get in – somebody else's race, run your own race, and things tend to work out. And prep for this, you said it, it allows you to become more successful and happier. And a lot of times as coaches, we, we talk about the success part. Happiness doesn't always go along with that. Is, is this approach really something that gives you that balance, that I can be successful and at the same time find a way to be happy and live a lifestyle that I want to live? Yeah, I think... You know, you see so many coaches that are just looking for the next job and then they're moving every year, every two years. And a lot of those guys aren't happy. And at the end of the day, you know, if you don't love yourself, you're not happy with what you're doing, is it really worth it? And for me to find a place where I truly love my job and I love the people that I coach with, I love the players that I see every day, and then to be successful, that like you, you can't beat that. And that's why I'm so fortunate because that is very, very difficult to find within this industry. So I'm just grateful every day to be in the position I am. When you look at all the things you do as a coach on or off the field, whether it's with your, you know, the individual unit or position you coach or your defensive unit, what's the one thing you do that you really feel gives your players the winning edge? 2020, when we were all sitting at home, you know, we took advantage of that time off and had Zoom meetings with our players. And what I realized is when I was a younger coach, and a lot of coaches do this, is they just teach their players their system and their verbiage, their terminology, and what they do. And we took advantage of that time off and really met with our players, and we've continued to do that as of today, is build our guys' football IQ and build their football toolbox and teach them what the offense is doing 
and why they're doing it. You know, this receiver has a nasty split. Why? These receivers are inverted. Why? Backfield stats, back depth, protection tendencies. This tight end is that receiver in this, this situation. And teach our guys what the offense is trying to do and why they're aligned certain ways and their tendencies. And the more we built, built our guys football IQ, the better our guys played and, and started to understand. So once we got to game planning and playing football games, they could take out one of those tools from that toolbox and understand exactly what the offense is doing. But we just have great young men that are hungry to learn the game. And it's a player led program. Our players are the ones who hold each other accountable in regards to putting in the hard work because there's no substitution for hard work, whether that be film study, whether that be practice habits in the weight room, in the classroom, in the community, because we're not always with our players. But when our players are the ones holding each other accountable, holding each other to that standard, you're going to be really successful. Coach, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time here today for our listeners. Uh, First of all, uh, areas that you recruit primarily, and what's the best way for them to get in touch with you if they want to learn more or have questions for you? Well, thank, thanks a ton, Keith. This has been fantastic. I had a great time and have a, have a ton of respect for you and, and what you do. You know, my, my recruiting territory really changed when Coach Spencer became the head coach. I, I have really a 40-minute circle around Naperville, Illinois, You know, so southwest suburbs, DuPage County, into Will County. But you can find me on Twitter at Coach Durking, D-I-E-R-K-I-N-G. And then my email right on our website, northcentralcardinals.com. But love talking football, love helping any way I can and be, you know, an advocate for this great game. Coach, best of luck to you. Continued success in your career and have a great 2023, hoping to see the Cardinals back in the national championship again. Thanks so much, Keith. Thank you again for the opportunity, and hope to talk to you soon. Be sure to check the links we mentioned in the show notes. Follow all we're doing on coachingcoordinator.com, and follow me on Twitter at Coach K. Grabowski. 